just to explain, so it's a Liverpool biennial, and then we interview people, and then we show it in the Blue Coat Gallery. Is that all right? So I'm an outsider of Liverpool, so I don't know much about anything yet. Well, I'm learning. I've been here for a couple of days. Can I sit down here? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, perhaps first question. I just went to the the church here. Are you from the same church, the Anglican church, or is it a cathedral, or is it uh, because I know it's Catholic and uh, on the Hope Street Catholic and. We, we are both Anglican priests. Yes. We don't work in the cathedral. We don't work in the cathedral. All right. Uh, you, you came to visit the, the, the cathedral that you're here now, or? No, we're here for a pint of beer and a chat. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it is allowed to drink beer as, as, a, as a priest. Oh no, oh. don't tell anybody. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> we'll, we'll cut it's off here. <laughs> it's essential. It's, it's essential. essential. <laughs> it's essential. <laughs> All right. Um, but, um, so the Anglican, what's the, the main difference between Anglican and Catholic? Um, I mean, in a few words, it doesn't you don't have to do the whole. Well, it's about authority, isn't it, in the end? Who's in charge? We're a slightly more democratic, yeah, and a bit more sort of ambivalent about it all. Yeah, there's a bit more of an authority structure in the Catholic Church. Although my impression is that most normal Catholics sit quite loose to that. They make yeah. their own decisions because they're quite wise, really. Yeah. yeah, it's probably because is it because the Pope is too high and you don't have to listen all the time. Kind of. Well, I, you'd have to ask the Roman Catholics that. Uh, but yeah. I couldn't really answer for them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and it, uh, the Anglicans are more uh, democratic in a way. So is there also someone who's kind of uh, a spokesperson for for the ideas of the of the way now? Well, there's there's a more dispersed uh, view of authority, which is more more shared um, on one level by bishops um, rather than just one bishop. Um, but also a more uh, a greater understanding of the important part that lay people have to play in the life of the church and in the uh, decision-making authority of the church. Uh, so it's it's seen as a more shared uh, understanding of being the body of Christ, of being you know, the people of God. Really, yeah. is, is there is there um, a big difference between? Um, the view on on the body of Christ between Catholics and uh, the Anglican uh, Church, or the opinions go the same way? I think there's an increasing uh, convergence, um, and especially as uh, conversations between the Roman Catholic Church and the Anglican Church um, have really been well developed. It's partly personal relationships, um, and history has played a big part. Uh, in keeping us separate, but in the last 20, 30 years, especially here in Liverpool, uh, there's been a, a massive um, coming together of the Roman Catholic and the Anglican uh, families, and an understanding that we are the people of God in this place, and that together we witness. Uh, and there are impressive moments when we do that, visually by having walks between the two cathedrals, uh, every other year as, as an act of witness that we witness together. Yeah. Uh, but history is always a potent uh, force in, in life and it takes a lot long time to um, reinterpret our history in, in, in present conditions but hopefully never being bound by it. Yeah. So now Liverpool uh, had also its history uh, between Anglican and, and uh, Catholic? Like is there is history in some parts of tension, but again, there's the, the official story and the unofficial story. And part of the unofficial story is that that tension wasn't as uh, you know as I don't know as, as developed as you might think, really. And people just got on on the yeah. whole. Yeah. I have the idea, the impression that it, it, Liverpool, uh, until now, what I've heard of people that they they kind of really do get along. Uh, between the different communities, I mean, I'm not talking only the religion, but also race, etc. Is it still something developing, typical? isn't it? I, think. Yeah. I mean, I think there has been. I mean, I mean, the, the black community. Your friend will know this more than we do. At one point, we stayed in Liverpool Eight, and you know, if you went into the shops in the town centre, you never saw a black face behind the counter. Mm -hmm. That's all changed now, and I think the modern generation just doesn't have an issue with this, yeah. whereas perhaps earlier generations did. My own daughters don't understand what the problem ever was. Yep. Yeah. 
So that's that's very good. It's fantastic. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's a really interesting city at the moment. There's a real buzz about it that there didn't used to be. And there's people from all over the place who live here now or visit here, and it's just fantastic. Yeah. Um, I was in the in the Anglican uh, cathedral, and what I've noticed, and which is also in, in different churches, there's a lot of uh, commercial space, like like for, for selling. How do you feel about that? Got to make a living, haven't they? Don't <laughs> <laughs> have to buy it. Most of it's junk anyhow. <laughs> Well, it's partly offering hospitality to people that uh, cathedrals have now realised they need to be places where, say, 20 years ago, there weren't even public conveniences in in the Anglican cathedral. Well, now they, you know, it extends from that, from um, being hospitable, offering people the opportunity to be able to eat, um, and, and where where people actually, uh, when they're interested or they're awakened in, in spiritual issues, then they want to find out more about them. Um, yeah, the, the reality is they're also tourists, or many of them are tourists, uh, and do what we all do when we're visiting places. We, you know, we buy things to remind us of where we visited. You know, some of it's good, some of it's junk, to be honest, but that's the way it is. I, I, I was told when, when um, I, I went to, um, to France once and see an old church, and they, they told me there that um, the old churches were also um, a kind of a gathering place for all kind of like beggars, uh, market people just sitting there, just enjoying. Is it, was that also in Anglican churches? Yeah. 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 In the past, there were meeting places for all sorts of things. Always yeah. have been. Yeah. I mean, I mean, my guess is that you're thinking of that biblical passage where Jesus chases the money yeah, changers yeah, out yeah, of the yeah, temple. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's not about uh, commerce. That's about exploitation. Because what the money changers did is they took ordinary money from people, made them change it into temple money at a, at a, at a rate advantageous to the money changers. So it's about right, exploitation. Yeah. That's yes, what's going that's on true. there. And, you know, and, and the notion that poor people had to pay to get any access to God, well, that made Jesus furious. Yeah. That's what that's about. Yeah, okay, so uh, um, the Anglican Cathedral can never be uh, uh, like an entrance fee or anything like that. That couldn't, shouldn't happen or... Well, I would hope not, and certainly in a place like Liverpool, that would be a, a sad day, I think, if we had to charge people to come in. Because as Pete said, you know, what really irritated Jesus was, was the fact that in financial transactions to allow people access to God, it's the poor who suffer. Yep. Um, and so the similar thing would happen with cathedral entrances, that, that actually it would be those who can pay the least who will, who will suffer. Um, and these are supposed to be places where we welcome people uh, that were open and hospitable. And yes, they cost us a lot to maintain. Perhaps we shouldn't have built them so big in the first place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that said, I mean, you know, perhaps that was an own goal. Uh, <laughs> but we've done it. It's there. But that's our problem. That, um, what we want to do is to encourage people to come in and to be as hospitable as, as possible. And what we don't want to do is to make a separation between religious space and the space of life. Uh, they are, as Pete said, gathering places and where we are and do all, all sorts of things. And we don't separate out God into a special space too much, I hope. Yeah. First thing I wanted to do, you're a student? Or? I am, yeah. Yeah, what do you study here? Uh, history and English, JMU. JMU is uh, John Moore? Liverpool John Moore Jr. Yeah, yeah. all right. Who's John Moore? Um, you know, I should really know that, given yeah. that I go to his university. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I saw I don't know him either. No, to be honest, I, I, I really should know that, but I don't. It was a Do big, you know? Uh, yes, it was a big... Um, the Moores family owned a lot of things in Liverpool. Yeah. Um, I don't want... I'm not prepared to give a big history <laughs> lesson, but he had, like... They used to have a mega involvement with Liverpool Football Club, Little Woods, have you heard of Little Woods? Like no. the catalogue yeah, and the pools and everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, John Moores, that was the Moores family. Oh, In fact, okay. James Moores is one of the people behind the biennial. Oh, okay. I thought I, I also thought there was a, a kind of a mathematician uh, more uh, and a philosopher, kind of, I don't know. Anyway, uh, but where are you yeah. from? You? Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm originally from Liverpool. I spent a lot of time growing up in Australia. Uh, yeah? Yeah, yeah, but I, I moved back here about eight years ago. All right, why Australia? 
Uh, my parents emigrated out there when I was a kid, so yeah. I, uh, yeah, I, I moved back here for what was meant to be a holiday. Yeah. And I kind of met a girl out here. So really? I've, yeah, 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 so yeah. I've, I've lived here ever since. Yeah, so you've been with your girl for how long now? About eight years, yeah. About, yeah. about seven and a bit. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, and why, why did you choose uh, your topic for, for the university? Is uh, well, I mean, history was a subject that I, I did quite well in at school. Um, it was what I you know, really enjoyed. And, and given that I aspire to be like a history teacher, so um, yeah. I'm doing this kind of undergraduate with the aim of going on to do postgrad teaching. And then, uh, and then hopefully become a history teacher. Is that a history teacher for kids like from 12 to 17? Yeah, secondary, 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 kind of GCSE or A level would be what I would aim yeah. for, yeah. Do you but think... The GCSE, the GCSE now will... The Gove levels, <laughs> yeah. The English <laughs> baccalaureate. GCSEs. No, I don't um, know, yeah. Because after O levels... Shall I interview you? No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, after O levels, which went, I think they went in about 19... About 1985, yeah. um, O levels went, and that was a, obviously a final exam. Yeah. And then they introduced GCSEs, and over the years, GCSEs have been more. They've been kind of yeah, put that, down a bit, haven't they? I, I, I think there's uh, there's certainly a lot of people who feel like GCSEs have, have are not a really good representation of how students are performing yes. anymore. Um, they, they they lack kind of rigor. And the Michael Gove, you know, the education secretary, uh, yeah. his idea is to bring in these these new set of exams, placing the emphasis more on uh, on examinations as opposed to uh, modular coursework over the course of a year. Uh, raising standards is his ultimate goal. And yeah. uh, whether that you know was actually the end result remains to be seen, I suppose. But uh, yeah, do you have a feeling that uh, students uh, of that age are doing well, and in comparison to to uh, like 10 years ago, 20 years ago? I, look, I don't think students are doing badly. What, what, what I do think, uh, certainly in my experience, um, my, you know, my, my, my father-in-law, future father-in-law, is, uh, is, is actually a marker for the GCSEs. Uh, he was a teacher himself and he, and he yeah. still marks examinations. And, and, and certainly in his opinion, and from what I've seen of the stuff he marks, um, we have less and less, fewer and fewer expectations of young people. Yeah. Um, and we're, we're, we're willing to accept and give, give decent grades for what I think, perhaps even since I was in school, is, is not work that warrants it. So I, I do think it's an admirable goal that, that the Education Secretary is trying to, uh, to raise standards. I don't know if the system he's proposing is actually the way that's going to happen. Yeah. Um, but I think, any, any, I, I think the current system is not ideal yeah. and I'd like, to see, I'd like to see it improved. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and do you think, like, for, for you, you chose your topic uh, because you knew already what you wanted to become in, in later years? Is this something a lot of students do in Liverpool? Uh, yeah, look, I, I think ultimately your career goals have to play a part in, in, in choosing your degree course. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's not a, certainly these days, it's not a cheap prospect. We're looking at uh, tuition fees of £9,000 per year. So, so just on, on tuition fees alone, 27000 by the time you've graduated. Um, so you're not just going to go and do something on a whim. I don't think yeah. you have to have a kind of clear goal in mind. I mean, that being said, Th does uh, everybody have to pay uh, twenty-seven thousand pounds? Or well, yeah. I mean, I mean, to, uh, as a domestic student, as an English student going to an English university, it's it's nine thousand pound a year at most unis. There is a, there's an upper limit of nine thousand pound at any British uni uh, English university. Some universities are charging less than that, but uh, yeah. well, not this one. Yeah. Uh, you know. <laughs> And a, lot, a lot of universities just went straight for the, the upper, uh, the yeah. upper limit, which was nine thousand, which is where you know what we're faced with now. So yeah, twenty-seven thousand. And do you get for. grants? Uh, of yeah, yeah. I don't I have mean, to pay it. Up. Yeah, yeah, I don't have to pay it up front. Um, you, you, you get a tuition loan, which you then pay back after you're earning over a certain amount. It's it's twenty something thousand a year. Once you're earning over that, you, you pay it incrementally the more you earn. Um, and so so ultimately, as a student, I'm not actually reaching into my pocket right now. Uh, but I will do as a as a graduate once I'm earning over that limit. I'll be All right. So 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 now you you're uh, facing a loan of twenty seven thousand uh, pounds. Yeah. Well, that's just for the actual uh, tuition. There's actually loans on top of that. There's um, um, I, I receive kind of student loans uh, to help support me while I while I am a student. Um, you mean to eat and to, to yeah yeah. It comes in two rent. parts. There's yeah. a uh, there's a uh, a maintenance grant and a maintenance loan. Maintenance grant uh, is uh, is means tested. Um, so not everyone can get that, but you don't have to pay that back. Uh, there's a maintenance loan which everyone can get. Don't put me up here. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah, maintenance loan which everyone can get, but that's that's repayable. So yeah. I uh, yeah that 
ultimately, I think by the time you take into account all of the loans, I'm probably looking somewhere in the region of £40,000, Allo, at the end of it. All right, and then £40,000, that that's, takes a long time to, to pay back? Yeah no, yeah, no question. I mean, ultimately, look, I, like I said to you before, if I never get a, a job, I can a decent graduate job uh, and I never start earning over that limit I'll never pay it back yeah uh, it, so it really is and, and, and I only pay it back in higher amounts as I start earning more so it really is a reflection on how well I I do as a result of my education so I would argue really I don't mind paying to a certain degree um, because going to university getting a degree is going to increase my earnings potential yeah. uh, in the years in the future I mean said as a teacher I'm never going to be a millionaire I'm never going to be a, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm never going to be a rich man <laughs> but uh, but I'm earning more than had I not gone and got yeah. a, an education. I think you know society pays for me to be educated to some degree, and I think it's part of paying that back to sort of the next generation. Yeah. Do you think like, w would it be an option, for example, to raise a little bit more taxes so so the loans go down? Uh, well, look, I mean, you could always make that argument that the higher taxation and, and increased public spending is a good thing. You know, I mean, in, in, in this country, we're already you know kind of fairly highly taxed. Uh, how, how much? You, you well, know? I think the, the, the upper the upper tax rate is fifty percent. Uh, yeah. That I think you've got to be earning a kind of fairly yeah. significant amount to be paying that. Yeah. Uh, but we also pay uh, you know significant amounts of, of VAT um, and lots of duty on things like fuel and yeah, you know, yeah, cigarettes. Yeah. You know, so yeah. so we're, we're quite highly taxed across the board. I think so. I, I don't necessarily think that the increasing taxation is is always the answer. Um, you know, I mean. Certainly, you could make that argument. As if you were left-leaning, um, you could argue yes, tax yeah. the rich more. You know, pay. You know, we should all pay more council tax and mansion taxes and you know yeah. uh, inheritance taxes. Um, I tend to think we pay quite a bit in this country already. So, yeah, uh, yeah I wouldn't necessarily. I, I don't. I don't personally have a problem with taking some personal level of responsibility for the financial cost of my education. Yeah. The thing is, for example. Uh in Belgium, we, we pay for education, university education. You will pay now, have to make the, I think about eight hundred pounds a year. Yeah, it's significantly less, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, but you, so people don't have to make it, take any loans to do yeah. that, and then, uh, but we pay. Everybody pays like fifty percent taxes. So not uh, the high, but also the the low. And yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, it sounds like Belgium's got a got a slightly more kind of. Um probably a more left-leaning economic system whereby yeah. people pay more and get more back from, yeah. from the government. I mean, that's just a question of, of, of politics at that point. I mean, I personally, Choices, yeah. I, I personally probably sit a little bit to the right yeah. of, of centre, so um, I, I don't necessarily think that everyone paying massive amounts of taxes and then receiving that back in the form of government aid is necessarily the best way to go about doing things. Yeah. Um, but, you know, how a country decides to run the, yeah, their yeah, affairs is entirely up to them. Yeah, and, and, and yeah, I mean, look, there are... I think that definitely that there are benefits to society as a whole to people being educated. So the, the more people getting a decent education, it might be good value for money for the government to, to, to invest in. And I think the government does invest in it mm -hmm. to some degree. Um, but at the same time, I think I, I get a very personal bonus out of getting being educated, both kind of in terms of my own well-being and, and financially I do. So I, I've got no issue really with yep. with paying some level of that. Nine thousand does seem a lot. It was a big jump. I think it was three thousand, or somewhere in the region of three thousand up mm -hmm. until recently. So there's been a significant jump. And oh yeah. Yeah. Um, so that means that somebody who was like ten years younger than you probably in the end had to pay nine thousand, and you're twenty-seven. Yeah. Look, I mean, the, the, the generation above me paid nothing, uh, oh, okay. and, and and certainly anyone sitting in Parliament today who who, who decided that nine thousand was a good idea, uh, they all got the university education free of charge. Um, so there's definitely a. The, the, yeah, but the, you could argue that they pay it back to twenty-seven thousand pounds now. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, the, yeah. I think there's a there's a bit of a a generational divide there where the, mm. they they got to reap the benefits of of, of a free system, uh, and they're now imposing upon us a, a slightly different system. That being said, there's always that you know, anytime yeah. there's going to be changes in the way you know a system works, the people who had it before are going to have it different to the people who have it now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, without. We're, I think nine thousand is a lot, but I, I'm not. I'm not worried about it. I'm not sitting here stressing about it. I know you hear yeah. a lot of students talking about how they've got lots of worries about finishing university deeply in debt. Yeah. Uh, and I will be in debt, but I, but I, like I say, I won't be paying it back unless I'm earning. Unless well, I'm what working. Hap what happens if, for example, you don't succeed and uh, and and it, it turns out that you're not. Um, uh, smart enough to to finish um, uh, university? Yeah, look, do you still have to pay? Uh, if I drop out, you you, pay, you don't have to pay for the whole degree. If I drop out after my first year, I'd owe the first year's worth of yeah, tuition yeah. fees. Uh, and the same thing would apply. And, and unless I was earning over a certain amount, I wouldn't be paying it back. Um, so, I, I, if I never succeeded and then spent the rest of my life doing a menial job, 
um, earning say twenty thousand a year, um, then then no, I wouldn't pay it back. Uh, I guess politics. Um, um, what about how do you feel about politics at the moment? Uh, I, d I don't think this government's doing all it can can do. Yeah. Um, I think there's a, a lot of difficulty really with the. Uh, with some of the things that are going on, I'll stay at times. Yeah, I guess I'll talk about that. Yeah, and um, I suppose you work around in this area? Yeah. So um, your work is that being affected by um, people taking leave and things like that? Yeah, yeah, we've seen increased um, annual, uh, we've seen, seen increased sickness leave, we've seen uh, a reluctance for uh, hourly rated staff to do overtime, things like that. Um, Childminders, nurseries, etc., are being cut back on. So uh, certainly, my my, member, my staff are spending more time going home, picking the kids up from school, rather than working overtime or doing doing other bits and pieces of work they could be doing. Right. When you said your staff, then what area of business are you in? Uh, I work for the courts. Oh dear. So I work across all the courts in the northwest, and we're a facilities company that manages the security, cleaning. And maintenance of those buildings. So. Right, and um, if you work in the course, do you feel, I suppose, do you have an idea whether like crime rates and things like that have that have they changed? I'm not, I'm not quite sure on that actually. Um, we're certainly seeing courts opening for longer, and I think they're uh, they're an indication of the austerity measures that are being taken. So a lot of, um, if you like, a lot of court users are being pushed into more centralised locations, so a lot of the more smaller courts, outlying courts, are being shut, right. and they're opening courts in Liverpool, for example, on Saturdays and Sundays. Yeah. So. Um, just another, just a question, different subject. Um, do you have any opinions on the recent Hillsborough story that's come out? I don't know. I don't have a, I don't have a lot of knowledge of that. Oh, right, OK. Well, thank you for speaking to us. That's great. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, well, actually, I already have, um, which is funny enough. Uh, I could, I could talk about a number of things because I'm an actor, comedian, and magician. You know, hence the reason I'm now now you see it in my shop. Got <laughs> well, in there. Um, but like, I, I could. I mean, I'm doing doing a couple of shows. I've just started. I was about three weeks ago as a professional magician, and like already up for like the freshers fair happening now in Liverpool, and like doing all that. You know, if anyone's around, scream. If you don't know it, you don't live. But um, no, I could because I mean, is it? Oh, it's, it is so much to say about my idea. Else. And then, you know, if they spoke to me, so I mean, 8 till 10 on Thursday, doing that. 
Um, but like, if you see me, I'm, I'm a giant online. Like, I have business cards. You can book me for lessons or you know shows. Yeah. Um, but I don't mind if like if, you, if I'm on a night out, I, I'll happily take that. And I'll you know I'll do stuff to entertain because I just I, I love it. I think it's so funny. I mean, we're just being working on the thing now where you know I show a card that's completely lost, but it's actually it's in plain sight, which is what's so funny about it. So how did this start off getting into magic? Uh, I started off a couple of years ago and I did it for about a year, but it was just children's tricks. But then about four months ago, I was walking around here and as I said, I, I was with my mate Joey uh, and we found Now You See It Magic Shop. And we walked in and we, this is where we first met John T. And he was like, oh yeah, and he recommended some stuff. And then we got talking and he was like, you know what, you two seem like you actually want to get into it. And he said, and he recommended some great DVDs. So good stuff, and then I've just been practicing ever since, and it's the reason like I come down today and I say to John, T, I've got a trick. Will you give me a recommendation on it?" And uh, you know, I'll show it, and he'll go, "That's good. You need to fix this." You know, but that's that's aces. You know, guys, and that's you know, that's how I got back into it. I've just been promoting myself ever since. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, how well is it going, like, other than the students? Um, it's it's going well. I was booked for a party to do Atlantic Towers a little while back. It sort of fell through just because he wanted me to show up earlier and I couldn't because I was already booked for a different show. Cheers, Dickie. <laughs> 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 yeah, you. And, um, and, uh, and since I couldn't show earlier, that fell through. But like, you know, uh, the Student Union, uh, the Hague, want me to come down and do some magic. I've got our charity gig booked with them as well for a Steve, uh, Stephanie Chopra. Waterstones have booked me for November 3rd and 4th. Uh, and then, of course, Screenbar booked me and said, you know, I'll come down for you, do two hours, and you know, we'll pay you so much. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. Doing well, then. Yeah. So, um, other than your magic, what else do you do around town? Uh, 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 just for social wise, oh, like, I just chill out with friends. Like, I'm just meeting one after she finishes work tonight at the F Arena. But um, I'm also a stand up comedian. I've worked with uh, the Hot Water Comedy guys, if you know them. Uh, I'm an actor. I worked with the Royal Court. Um, I the Royal Court. The Lansing Theatre, that's what I'm trying to think of. Um, do stuff like that. I mean, like, and then sometimes just with performance rates. I mean, last Sunday we were about, and it was the British Women's Open, I think, for golf, and they were advertising the tissues. And me and my fellow magician mates and comedian, uh, comedian actor mate Sean uh, Cranny, was uh, about uh, what we did was we just started doing magic. We got this, we got this into film just to watch because we were just walking by. So, oh, would you mind being some shots? And then, uh, and then we got balls, and we were just showing magic, and then we got tons of people around for them, yeah. and we said like that, and then we just went, oh, we're part of this. We went, but we were just part of this, and then they, they loved us, because we just went, oh yeah, they booked us with that, and they went, oh, let's go talk to them, and then they got promoted. And it's just stuff I do, I mean, like, my friend Tom Ledge comes down, and he was uh, from the Lake District, and this is when they're playing to the Iron Beach, was about. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the channel thing. And he can play piano. So what we did was we started singing. He, he played CeeLo Green. We got a guy who was walking by with his guitar to join us. Tom took the guitar. The guy played piano. And we got a couple of people singing CeeLo Green, Forget You, yeah. and Dancing in the Moonlight. Oh, really? Just, just, just the fact that we was bored on a Sunday. Yeah. I love that around town. There's always something you can get involved with like that. Yeah. Thank you for coming to Yeah, no worries.